Welcome to Shiloh Sunday School Online. We are so glad to be back with you and so excited to walk with you once again through the Word of God. First of all, let me thank you for your thoughts or your prayers as I went through several severe allergy reactions. Psalm 34 and 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And it certainly felt like an affliction for the last two weeks, but God is good. And that scripture truly is true and accurate. So I'm very glad to be back with you today. We are getting ready to end our time with Mr. James. In this lesson, James talks about teachers and the big difference our tongues can make in a negative way. So if you have your Sunday School uh, quarterly ready, your teacher's book ready, or your commentary ready, let's go ahead and get started in this lesson. As always, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. And today's lesson is called Bite Your Tongue. Our devotional reading comes from Isaiah, the 50th chapter, the 4th through the 11th verses. And our background scripture and print passage come from James, the 3rd chapter, the 1st through the 12th verses. Our key verse today says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. And that comes from James, the third chapter, and the fifth verse. Why does this lesson matter? Well, the spoken word can either be an affirming or destructive force in the lives of vulnerable humans. How can the affirming prevail in human interactions? James informs believers that only through the discipline required in taming the tongue can the fruits of godly wisdom be made visible in the lives of others. As always, in your books and in your literature, there are different questions. So we have some questions for you to consider about today's lesson. The first one is, who will be judged strictly? The second one is, who stumbles in many ways? The third one asks, what examples did James use to describe the tongue? And the next one is, what is the tongue like? And the last question to consider is, who can tame the tongue? As always, we have three lesson objectives or three lesson aims. And the first one is, explain how bits and bridles, ships and rudders, and small sparks illustrate the power of the tongue. Our second lesson objective is repent of times when use of our tongue has ignited a destructive fire. And then our last lesson objective is practice controlling the tongue so that it becomes consistently a source of healing and refreshment to others. What can we say about the tongue? Today, I'm going to share a short story with you that can be found on the internet and also in many illustrations. A man, excuse me, <clears throat> a man who was a strong believer in Christ and always telling his family about the Lord set out one day to build a wooden trellis to support a climbing vine. As he pounded away, his nephew came outside to watch him. The youngster didn't say a word, so the uncle kept on working, thinking that his nephew was going to leave, but he didn't. Finally, the man asked, well, son, are you picking up some pointers on gardening? No, he replied. I'm just waiting to hear what a Christian says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. So we've all seen illustrations, many illustrations of someone hammering away and they're hitting a part of their hand. And so many times we do not hear godly words. We see here that the tongue 
has the capability to ruin friendships, reputations. It's wrecked more homes, split more churches, and caused more hatred than any other weapon in the world. So we can see that something that's just so small has a great deal of power. In Isaiah 50, 4 through 11, which is our devotional reading, and James, the third chapter, the first through the twelfth verses, they teach us the importance of having guided utterances. In Isaiah 50, the prophet speaks of the confidence he has in his utterances because the words he speaks are from God. He knows that he will not be put to shame no matter the storm around him. In verse 10, he admonishes people who fear God and obey his commands to continue to walk that path. In James 3, James warns the assembly of Christians against false teachings and advises that we are to tame our tongues. He explains that the tongue, despite being small, is capable of destroying a person. Outline number one, the challenge of the tongue. James, the third chapter, the first through the fourth verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. When those who were Jews converted to Christianity, many of them desired to become teachers because that was a highly honored and respected office. However, just as every spiritual gift is given by the Holy Spirit, teaching is a gift and an office into which people need to be called rather than just calling themselves. In any spiritual position, those who call themselves must keep themselves. Those whom God calls, God keeps. The reason why spiritual teachers are judged more strictly is because they are in a position to shape and influence others who are in the vulnerable position of being a student. Teachers are held responsible for the content that they teach as well as the example they set by the lives they live. Jesus felt so strongly about this that in Matthew 18 and 6, he said, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. In addition to being called by God to teach, some of the other important and desirable characteristics for spiritual teachers include, one, good teachers have genuine love for the student population being taught and a connection with understanding of their students. They also can overlook temporary flaws in order to fulfill a greater cause. Number two, all good teachers have a little bit of preacher in them, and all good preachers have some teacher in them. In other words, there should be insightful instruction delivered with conviction, passion, and enthusiasm. Number three, good teachers are current and relevant. Good teachers are good students of the culture and of the felt needs of the class. Number four, good teachers are transparent and they keep it real. Teacher, students are drawn 
and, in and captivated by teachers who do not mind displaying appropriate personal vulnerability in order to gain the trust of the students so that they can adequately identify with them. Number five, good teachers incorporate their students into the learning process. When students are involved in the subject matter through interactions rather than in the subject matter, than being detached, the percentage of learning and comprehension significantly increases. Good teachers teach both for education and for transformation. They are not satisfied with mere head knowledge, but they keep pushing for a change in the heart and in the life of the student. Everybody has faults and no one is exempt from personal flaws, spiritual shortcomings, and character deficiency. James makes it clear that no one could avoid a stumble of the tongue, not even the teacher. If they could, they would have the discipline to be perfect in every other way. James uses the examples of the horse's bit and a ship's rudder to illustrate how something relatively small can control something relatively large. Outline number two, the corruption of the tongue, James 3, 5 through 8. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of the evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. James spoke of the tongue as if it operated independently. This must be tempered with what Jesus says about the role of the heart and what comes out of the mouth. Matthew 12, 34 through 35 says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So we see controlling the heart becomes the key to controlling the tongue. To ensure that his readers fully understood the trouble of an uncontrolled tongue, James shared four interconnected warnings, statements, First of all, the uncontrolled tongue is a fire, ready to consume the speaker and those spoken to. Second, it is a world of evil, all to itself, ready to take over the life of the speaker. Third, the uncontrolled tongue will corrupt the whole body, making it unrecognizable to what it was. Finally, it does have both a temporal and eternal end. The uncontrolled tongue consumes the life of the speaker in this life and leads to eternal damnation and hell's fire. To prove that point, James mentioned how humankind had tamed all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures, but not the tongue. Because it never rests, human beings are just not able to control the tongue. So in order to correct that, here's an acronym that will help you before you speak, and it's called THINK. So first of all, the T stands for, is it true? The H stands for, is it helpful? 
The I is, is it inspiring? The N stands for, is it necessary? And K stands for, is it kind? If we would think and ask ourselves these questions, then we would not be a part of that spark that started a forest fire. Outline number three, praising and cursing. James 3, 9 through 12. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. In these verses, they record James' summary of the section of his writings. He begins with a contradiction in terms. From the same tongue come both blessings with respect to the Lord and curses toward human beings. The irony of blessing the Lord with the same mouth that curses those made in his likeness has a parallel to it. And 1 John 4 and 20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? James' admonishment against being two-faced in verse 10 is a reminder of what Jesus called the two greatest commandments in Mark 12, 30, and 31. We believers must love God and our fellow human beings without hesitation. Our words do mean something. They reflect who we really are. That's why James' metaphor in verses 11 and 12 presented the implausibility of a Christian spewing both praises and cursing. No one would expect to drink salt water from a fresh spring, freshwater spring. Likewise, we would not expect to harvest grapes from a fig tree or figs from a grapevine. This concept is further affirmed in Luke 6 and 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A tongue that speaks good belongs to a person with a pure heart. Having both praises and curses coming from the same tongue just as untenable as darkness and light being able to exist in the same space. What then is the cure for being double-tongued? We will get the answer in next week's lesson. See James 3 and 13 through 18. So we have finished our text for today and we are ready to take a look at our life applications or some of our takeaways from this lesson. First of all, why don't we consider taking a WOW approach in our personal interactions? WOW stands for watch our words. Of course, we will need help. The good news is that God's Holy Spirit is within us and is ready, willing, and is able to help. And I know there have been plenty of times in my life that I had to ask the Lord to control my tongue. I did not want to be someone who said something that I knew immediately would hurt that person. So every time that I've asked the Lord to temper my tongue, control my tongue, he has come through. And as I've said before, I have not started any forest fires that would destroy a person's or a vulnerable person. Our next life application says, unfortunately, added by social media, words have been greatly amplified in our society. 
that makes it imperative for every believer to share more good words to help overcome the bad. Remember that Facebook and Twitter are only as bad or good as the content that is shared. And we are now what we call an a cancel culture. In other words, you say the wrong thing, you could lose your job, you could lose your livelihood, you could use your career. Most of all, you, you, you lose the respect of those who looked up on you. So we have to be careful when we look at social media or if we're using social media, so many hateful words are out there. And as Christians, we should not be a part of that. So as Christians, we should be sending used to be in the 60s, they would say, sending you love, sending you light, okay? And sending you good vibes. We should always have something pleasant and refreshing to say not only to our brothers and sisters in the household of faith, but those outside of the household of faith so that they can look at us and say that we're truly a child of God. Our next takeaway take says, have you ever said something you wish you could not take back? Once a word is out, it cannot be returned. Repent of times when you have used our, your tongue to ignite a destructive fire. Then yield to the power of the Holy Spirit so you do not sin with your lips. And we just talked about that. Once those words are out of your mouth, they're out there. You can't make up an excuse. I didn't mean any harm. I didn't really mean that. I'm sorry I said that. Those are all excuses. And what that's showing is whatever's in your heart is what's coming out of your mouth. And then our last application is, as a Christian, your life reflects God. Re ensure that your words are consistent with your Christian character so that it becomes a dependable source of healing and refreshment. Since what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, dealing with the heart first becomes key to controlling the tongue. And I think this one says it all. We are Christians. We profess to the world that we are Christians. So our character and our words should be Christian-like. And so if we're confessing that Jesus Christ saved us and that we are a Christian and we stand for certain principles, then our words should back up our walk. So with that, we have finished the Shiloh Sunday School lesson for today. I was very excited to be able to teach it to you. I know my voice sounds a little squeaky or a little off, but God is good. And I know it takes a little bit of time to come back from um, allergy reactions. I had a severe one, and uh, but I have total faith in God that he will bring me through. So thank you for listening to me. I want to go ahead and make this announcement that our new literature is in. And if you have not picked up the fall issue, um, Sister Mitchell, who is our first assistant superintendent, will be up to the church this Friday, August 28th, from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And then also, um, it's time to order our commentaries. Your literature that you will pick up from Sister Mitchell is absolutely free. That's the least that we could do for you. But the commentaries, which are a yearly um, commentation on the Sunday school lessons, giving more and more explanation, those cost. And I believe they're around $21, at least they were last year. So if you would like to order a commentary this Friday, have your money ready, speak with Sister Mitchell, and she'll be glad to place that order for you. And then the uh, books will come back very shortly. So if you have our adult quarterly, if you have our teacher's guide, and you have our commentary, then you are fully um, ready, and you have so many resources at your hands that you'll fully understand the Sunday School lesson each and every Sunday. So we certainly hope that you will come up if you haven't already got your literature, share it with someone, and um, just be a part. 
and follow along with us on Sunday mornings. Also, we're getting closer and closer to November 3rd, which is election day. We want to make sure that everyone in Shiloh has an opportunity, first of all, register to vote if they haven't, and be able to cast their vote, whether it be by absentee ballot, whether it be by going down to the Marion uh, County Clerk's office, or just packing a lunch and going to uh, the polling place. The Sunday school teachers are prepared to help you in whatever way you need to be helped to make sure that you take advantage of your right to vote. We cannot continue in the as we have in the last four years. And if we get out and vote the way that we can and should, then we can turn this thing around and get out the president and get our new president in. We're looking at pres uh, former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris, who has the great distinction of being the very first African-American uh, to be nominated as Vice President uh, for a national um, party, which is the Democrats. And so um, again, the Shiloh, Shiloh Sunday School teachers will be glad to help you with whatever you need as far as voting is concerned and any other things. So um, we are looking forward to helping you and more will be said about that next week. All right. So we've learned a lot in this quarter. We've talked about social injustice. We've talked about getting wisdom from God. And I just thank the Lord so much for putting on the mind of these writers to go ahead and talk to us about social injustice and how we need to speak up with our voices and then getting wisdom from God to make sure that we're making the right choices. I know that these uh, lessons are prepared way, way in advance. And so for the Lord to go ahead and touch these writers and to go ahead and talk about these subjects at this time, it, what a wonderful God that we serve because we certainly need that. And so um, we are so glad that we've had the opportunity to go through this quarter with social injustice, also with getting wisdom, and then also practical advice from James. So before I leave, I do want to pray us out, and then we will go from there. And let us bow our heads. Most heavenly and all wise God, we just thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to preach, to teach, to give what you have given to me to give to others, Lord. We thank you for those Sunday school students who, who love you, Lord. They love your word. They love reading. They love learning about you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to assign your Holy Spirit to be our firefighter, putting out the sparks of our words before they ignite a firestorm of hurt. We ask you for your guidance to lead and keep us in everything that we do. We thank you in advance for helping us along the way. Continue to look after Shiloh, Shiloh's members, our pastor, and his family, Lord. Continue to keep them in your arms of protection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And with that, again, it's been a pleasure to be with you. We hope to see you next week. Continue to social distance. Think about some things that you might need that we can help you with, and we will be glad to. May God bless you. May God smile upon you and continue to keep you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.